Hello everyone, this is Joel Ramirez, Director of Medical School Tutoring Medical Coach. So excited to be with you guys today. Today I'm going to be joined with Dr. Ryan Colasso and Ann Boss. We're going to talk about maximizing your question banks. We're going to give you some question solving strategies for a successful exam preparation. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan. Thank you Joel for the introduction. I am a physician editor at Amboss and I've had a role in a lot of the questions that you kind of read on Amboss, I've had some kind of role in either creating them or cross-checking them. And uh, today together, hopefully Joel and I can help you really maximize the utility of what is a very crucial part of your preparation, which is the question bank. So there is us again in our roles at Amboss and Med School Coach. Uh, I'm the director of medical school tutoring, so I run our tutoring prog uh, program, and Dr. Colasso is a physician editor and then also an IMG affairs manager. So he takes care of a lot of the question writing and content creation and really prepares the IMGs for success. Here's a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll, we'll start with Dr. Colasso. He's going to tell us a little bit about how you should use question banks in your exam preparation. He's going to talk to you about how these questions are written, which is really exciting because he writes a lot of these questions. So he writes a lot of these questions and he's going to kind of give you the tips and tricks on how to beat them. Then we'll talk about how to integrate questions into your study plan, how to leverage question banks to maximize your score. And then we're going to show you a few ways to do this. So we'll demonstrate. So Ryan and I will go back and forth and kind of talk you through how you would do a question and how you would review a question. Lovely. Yes. Uh, thanks, Joel. So, all right. Coming to my part of the presentation now, the, the thing is, all of you already either know it or have heard a million times how important your, the question bank is going to be to your USMLE preparations, right? For the most part, we understand that it's going to be the spine of your USMLE preps. Now, having said all of that, you do, it does, it does help to kind of zoom out and wonder what is the exact role that a question bank should play in there in the sense that what are the exact granular uh, description in which you should be using a question bank so as to maximize all the benefit that you can get from it, right? So the first question is, why use a question bank? How did it suddenly become, or rather, how did it over time become this, this indispensable part of your preparation, right? So... Just to delve into that a bit more, I want to show you this little, uh, this meme, this cartoon, whatever, uh, that that depicts a situation that I faced a lot when I first started solving questions as a student. Uh, there would be a lot of times when I would look at a question uh, on a question bank and it would make absolutely no sense to me. And I knew it was from a topic that I had studied, but I just didn't know what was happening out there. And then later, when the explanations got revealed, when I was going through the explanations, or when I was discussing it with my study partner, I, re I had one of those face palm moments, right? Where I'm wondering, uh, how on earth did I not recognize that they were testing something that I knew so well that I had read? And yeah, and I just didn't kind of grasp that that was what was being tested. So the main if I, if I had to boil it down to what is the main role of the question bank, it is to help you recognize exactly what is being tested. Because for the most part, we will pick up a lot of the knowledge as we go get through our preps. Uh, the What determines whether you're going to be able to apply that knowledge is, how you, uh, is your use of the question bank, right? I love playing football. I've always played it since I was a kid. And one of the most important things that my coach as a kid used to say was there are a lot of ways that we could build fitness, right? And we could get better at being uh, physically ready for a game. It could be aerobics, it could be cardio, it could be weightlifting. But the only way we got better as a team playing the game uh, uh, being better at playing together as a team is if we played the game together more often, if we practice doing that. And in the same way, um, even for rock climbing, uh, Zeb, who is our managing editor at Amboss, uh, is an avid rock climber. And he says that the best way to train for climbing, uh, according to the Bible of rock climbing, is climbing, right? 
So what is it that we are going to do during the steps in the exam hall? We are going to try to consistently solve case-based MCQs correctly, correct? So what would be the best way to get better at solving case-based MCQs? Well, solving more case-based MCQs. Why? Because science, I mean, it's, it's not something that I'm coming up with. What we see is that the strongest correlate, according to multiple studies, uh, that shows evidence to be uh, correlated with uh, a higher score at the step exams is the number of questions that you do. And not just more questions uh, in terms of quantity, but also quality. The number of unique questions that you do, the number of questions that you do that test the same concept from different angles uh, is almost uh, proportional to the um, the score that you will end up with at the end of your steps. Now, going with that thought process that doing more questions, unique questions is going to correlate with a higher step score for you. Why has, uh, keeping that in mind, we, let's explore why is question bank solving such an effective or rather indispensable way to prepare for the USMLE? So it has, historically, this is what has happened. We've, we've started, tended to believe that question solving is the be all and end all of scoring high at the USMLE. But it got there because of a function that it serves. There is a purpose that the question bank is supposed to serve, right? And Joel is going to talk about this coming up later, that all of your USMLE prep should contain uh, two phases. The first phase is basically when you're building your knowledge base, right? You are only going to test yourself when you have, when you have knowledge. So that knowledge building phase, when you're preparing in that phase, uh, at that point, the role that a question bank plays is to help you recognize ways in which a certain concept will be tested in the actual exam, right? Because it, it, this harks back to that same meme that I was talking about, that a lot of times the trick is knowing when you are being tested on something that you know, rather than uh, just the knowledge, right? So it's during your knowledge building phase, it's going to help you recognize ways in which the concept is tested. The second thing is a solid question bank, a high quality question bank, for example, you world, for example, us at Amboss, uh, will help you study in a targeted manner. Why? Because these question banks will have important topics repeated more often or tested in different ways, right? For it, I, I can give you a little insight into how we work here at Amboss. We have a whole uh, data team and the whole uh, 60 or 70 of us medical editors. And we use this collective data insight and our experience to kind of uh, draw a profile of what topics are extremely important for the USMLE, what topics are going to be tested more, more often, in short, what topics are more high yield. And then according to that, we decide the weightage, the number of questions that need to be on, your, uh, on, on our question bank. And what that kind of makes sure is that when you're reading with, uh, or when you're solving questions with Amboss, and uh, this is true for any high yield question bank, uh, I mean, a high quality question bank, true for UWorld, true for Rx. When you do these question banks and when you go through them, when you do your first pass, second pass, what you're doing is you are reinforcing the high yield topics more often, right? And Another thing during your knowledge building phase that uh, the question bank is help, going to help you at least put the base down up about is to learn how to manage time. Uh, during the step, uh, you have 280 questions. Seven uh, For step one, it will be seven blocks of 40 questions each, uh, right? And each block, you have only 60 minutes, which means that on an average, you have 90 seconds to solve a question. And if you are not on top of your game during those eight hours that you are in the exam hall, or if you're not on top of your game solving every single question, you are going to mess up a lot of questions at the end because you'll be rushing through them. 
So when you are preparing, when you start building your knowledge, your, the question bank is going to help you learn how to manage your time. And then the, during the test prep, during, uh, during your test prep dedicated phase, the most important thing is it's going to continue to teach you how to learn time management, but also it's going to help you target weaknesses and form new memory retrieval pathways. So when you do self-assessments, when you look at your analysis, uh, say in Amboss, if you're studying with Amboss, you look at your analysis, you know where you're weak and you know where you need to concentrate to uh, consolidate that knowledge further, right? So these are the purposes that a question bank should fa uh, should fulfill at different phases of your prep. But because of these purposes, also because a QBank fulfills these purposes, today it is the most important thing that, that you will have to do to get through your USMLE prep journey. All right, so let's look at the questions. And one of my... One of the favorite quotes that kind of stayed with me through med school was something that my chief of surgery used to say. Uh, he said that the most valuable part of your stethoscope is the part that goes between the ear pieces, which uh, by which I'm guessing he meant now, or this is what I took from it, that you can have the most amazing tool at your disp uh, at your disposal, right? But what matters at the end of the day is your knowledge of using the tool. So you could end up with uh, access to the best question banks, the best review material. But if you don't know how to utilize these tools, then it's highly unlikely that you are going to maximize the benefit you get out of them. So when it comes to question banks, the, ma uh, the main part of them is the questions. What I would like to do is having written these questions and having been trained so extensively in uh, the way NBME writes the questions, the guidelines that they've set up for these questions, I'd like to give you a little bit of a perspective from the point of the exam writer. And hopefully, uh, in in keeping with what Sun Tzu said in Art of War, have, knowing your enemy is going to be the best uh, weapon in your kind of arsenal, right? So... Jumping into that, this is how a typical NBME question looks like. Uh, this is a screenshot taken from an Amboss question, but our questions are very, very reflective of the exam, as you will notice if you've ever used them. So a typical NBME question uh, will appear to you exactly like a patient comes to you. When a patient comes to you, they don't come to you saying that, hey, I am chapter number 27 from your Davidson's uh, textbook of medicine, volume 18, right? What they are going to come to you is with real world complaints. They are going to come to you with a lot of information. They, uh, they'll have a past history, a surgery history. They'll have a history of medication. They'll have a lot of labs with them. And this is exactly what you see when you look at a USMLE case. Uh, so, the golden rule that you will hear is that this is an app, uh, that you will require an application of your knowledge. The question is not clearly asking you, for example, what is the side effect of metformin? That's not what they are asking you. What they are asking you is uh, what what the NBME is trying to test is whether you can recall and then integrate uh, your knowledge into real life tasks as you would do in the hospital. Right. Um, additionally, you'll notice that there's a lot of window dressing. There is a lot of extraneous info. In the words of the NBME itself, uh, there are items, when they say items, they refer to the questions, tend to have a mix of important and unimportant findings, which is also true in real life, where there will be parts of the patient's picture which are not going to be extremely relevant to solving the case. But you, as a good doctor, as a good test taker, will need to develop that pattern recognition, that intuition to pick out the information which is most relevant to solving that question, right? And then the last bit is a little controversial because I, when I was solving the questions, never felt this. But it, each question should be possible to answer without looking at the options. Now, this is... A little difficult seems also a little uh, 
unlikely, but what they are trying to say through this is that every single thing that you require to solve this question, every piece of information that you require is in there in the question somewhere. So either you've missed it out or you are not reading it or seeing it in the way that you uh, that is required to solve the question, right? Then the next thing, and this is something that we face with a lot in Amboss. So uh, with the Amboss question bank, you can send us feedback, right? If you find something which is right or wrong. And we have like this whole team which sits um, on a daily basis and the only job of these 10 to 12 doctors and physician experts is to reply to your feedback. And we face this a lot where students come to us and say, hey, if if this and this was the case, then option B also could have been correct or option E could also have been correct. And we have to keep explaining to the students that yes, there is a good chance that another option could be correct, but the NBME is looking for the most likely correct option. Which of the following options is most likely? Even if you looked at the example, uh, you will see that the question asks, which is the most appropriate in the patient at this time? And what that means is every single option will have two or three points from within the case, it can have rather, two or three points from within the case, which could, which make it a correct answer. What we need to find out is which of these options has the most points in favor of it being the correct answer, Right. So this is an important point. I really hope those of you at least who are at your early parts of your prep internalize this, that there can be a lot, uh, there can be other options which may appear correct, but you have to choose the one which is most likely to be correct. The last, this other slide uh, has a lot of information. I don't want you to read through all of it, but the main part of this is that all NBME questions always have a fixed structure. This does not mean that every question is going to have all of these elements in here, but whenever any of these elements are present, they are present in this order. Why is this important? Because as I said, you have 90 seconds to solve a question, right? So if I'm looking at a question, I read the lead in first and I say, hey, okay, at, uh, considering what they are asking me, considering the question, what I want is to find out whether this patient um, is, is drinking alcohol. So what I'm looking for is risk factors, right? If I know and internalize that every question is going to have this structure, I'm not going to waste time reading through the whole question. I'm just going to say, okay, I'm going to look at alcohol, go right above the physical appearance, and there it is. There's the alcohol history. If I, and I mark my answer, I get my information, mark my answer, move on, right? And this is what we are trying to kind of, uh, I'm trying to convey that if you internalize the structure, if it becomes muscle memory, and this is bound to happen if you're solving question banks, those of among you who have already given a step would know this, that this becomes so intuitive that at, at any moment uh, in your dedicated, if you are looking at a question and you want to see something, you can almost zero in without having to browse through the question. But that ability, the uh, uh, developing that talent is extremely important when you are solving the questions, right? So as I was saying, I've kind, uh, this was done by uh, Zeb, a managing editor, where he's kind of marked out the different parts. So if I'm looking in this case, okay, I'm looking for medication history. I see here are the vitals, so the medication have to be right there. And that's where it is, right? All right. What else uh, can I tell you about the questions? So in general, the you will have about four to five image-based questions per block. Uh, these are increasing a little bit in number, but over the years, we've been tracking these trends and four to five is about the average. These questions are going to be histology images, radio, uh, so radiographs, and it will definitely require a certain amount of skill in interpreting uh, histology, in interpreting radiographs, in interpreting ECGs. And it's something that you will develop as you get through your question banks. 
what is good about image and illustration questions is that you may have an opportunity to mark them quicker or ma uh, get to the answer quicker by looking at the image and reading the the lead in question. Uh, another thing is examination videos. Uh, you might get one or two questions per block where there is a video of um, I, either someone's chest being auscultated. So then, uh, and it could be interactive in the way that you could take the bell of the stethoscope through the pulmonary tricuspid aortic areas to uh, to note the uh, characteristics of the murmur. Or you may have an examination video of, for example, resting tremors of Parkinson and uh, kind of... Um, you need to identify these very, very key features. Uh, and additionally, nowadays, because uh, if you've noticed, there has been a change in the weightage of the USMLE step, uh, step syllabus. So ethics is going to have a little more weightage going ahead from 2020 May onwards. And that's the reason why there you will find one or two videos with patient interactions, uh, patient behaviors where the communications or ethics part of the uh, case uh, is being tested. What else? The last few things are that buzzwords, and this is a trap that we as students fall into a lot of times, that you're supposed to know buzzwords, but the NBME tends to give you the description of the buzzwords. So you need to know the description rather than the fact... Uh, the, the the question is never going to say the patient comes with a strawberry tongue. What you're going to get is uh, it's an arithmetic macroglottic tongue with lack of uh, papillary uh, or, or with papillary hyperplasia. And in the same way with uh, combo pearls like these triads and pentads, Charcot's triad, uh, triad for for an example, uh, just because a patient uh, case or a question comes to uh, does not have, let's say, jaundice, there's a patient with abdominal pain and fever, and everything in there fits acute col cholangitis, you do not rule out acute cholangitis just because jaundice is not there. This is because even in real life, a patient does not appear to you as a classical triad or a pentad, right? So uh, the NBME, because they are trying to test r your actual clinical skill, are not going to um, get pedantic on you because of that. So uh, these are a few things that you need to be careful of. That being said, you still need to know these things because at the end of the day, they are easy memory tips. When you know in your mind that reactive arthritis is can't see, can't peek, can't climb a tree, you're going to remember it much better than reactive arthritis with a triad of conjunctivitis, urethritis, arthritis. All right, all that being said, now I'm going to hand uh, control over to Joel and he's going to take you through how you are supposed to integrate question banks into your study plan. All right, thanks, Ryan. It's super interesting to hear you talking about writing questions and how questions are structured. I, I, we work with a lot of students when, who struggle to make their way through questions and we give them a lot of kind of test-taking strategies that you had talked about. So it's just really interesting to see how like multiple sources independently get to the same conclusion. But I think that's really good advice and, and can really help students be successful. So we're going to move on and um, instead of talking specifically about how questions are structured, we're going to talk about how you can integrate those questions into your study plan. That's a common question we get. So one question we get is, when should I do questions? And I think Ryan alluded to this earlier. There are two ways that you want to use questions. You want to use questions early on when you're doing what, what we reference as a content review. So that's really when you're trying to learn the material and you're trying to get as much in your brain as possible. And then the second phase is when you are specifically preparing for the tests. So I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, but I think I think of them a little differently. When you're learning content, you're really focusing on learning theories, understanding concepts, and memorizing. When you're doing like a test prep, you're really focused on getting the answer, getting the question correct. So this is a multiple choice exam. You don't necessarily need to know all the answers to get the right answer. So two different phases, learn the content and actually train yourself to answer multiple choice questions correctly. So the first one is going to be intermittently doing our content review. So the first phase, I usually recommend people to do 
a handful of questions a week. Your main focus during a content review is to review and learn the content. So watching videos, um, doing reading your textbook, things like first aid, things like that. I think it's useful to integrate some questions during the study period. It's not going to be your main focus, and in fact, it should only take five to ten percent of your time. But usually, uh, it's not like a one or two blocks a week on the weekend or at the end of the week. I think is really useful, and I think that's useful because it allows you to um, start practicing questions early and start really getting a sense of what is going to be expected of you when you take this exam, and then. The second phase is going to be very a very intense period of questions before your exam, and that's what I would call a test prep. And the goal here is just to become a master at multiple choice questions. So you're going to spend all day, every day, doing questions. You should be doing anywhere from three to five blocks a day of 40 questions, and you're just going to do the questions and review the questions. And really the goal of this period is to master your ability to approach questions and to answer questions. You don't need to know everything, but you've got to make sure you're getting those answers right. And so one thing that I often recommend people to do is actually do the questions when you're the most fatigued. So step one and step two CK are really long exams. You're sitting there for so long in front of the computer at your testing center. And after several hours, you're going to get really tired. And I think it's really useful to get used to practicing questions when you're really tired. So I typically ask students when they're least productive with the day. And this is different for everybody. Some people are really unproductive in the morning. Um, some are unproductive in the evening or the afternoon. I want you to ch take that time. And I think that's when you want to do the questions. When you're the most tired and you're the least productive normally, use that time to get through some questions. And I think doing questions in that kind of situation will really prepare you to, to remain focused and vigilant even when you're tired, which is going to be really useful when you're actually taking the exam. The next question I get is, how should I do these questions? And I think that the answer is uh, actually not as clear as, as most people would think, which is why we get asked it often. So whenever you're doing questions, you want to do blocks of 40. And I think it's really useful to do the blocks of 40 because that is what your exam is going to be like. So I think it's really useful to get used to the timing and the structure of a 40 block, a 40 question exam. So I would avoid doing like the five to 10 block question block and really focus on 40 blocks, uh, 40 questions in a single block, even if that means you have to uh, readjust your schedule. So instead of doing like questions every day, maybe you just spend some time one day a week doing questions. So you could do that block of 40. During your content reviews phase, so when you're first starting to study and you're really learning these concepts and learning these theories, I think it's useful to do questions by, con by, by subject, and I often find that it's useful to do the questions by the subject that you're reviewing. So when you make your study plan, if you are doing it by system and say one week you're studying cardiology, then I think it's useful then at the end of the week you do one or two blocks of cardiology-only questions. And I think that's useful because it's um, cognitively, it's a little easier to learn in that situation. And then, you know, it's almost like a quick test because you spent all week mastering heart failure and coronary artery disease, and now you get to test your knowledge. So were you really understanding what you're reading? And sometimes you'll feel like you, you, you really, what you read and you thought you understood, you really did understand because you can apply it to a question. And sometimes you'll be surprised at uh, some things you might have read and thought you understood, but you, you couldn't quite apply it to a question. And that's a great opportunity to circle back and review that stuff. After your content review phase, um, so moving on to your test prep, it should always be random order. So always be random order for the test prep. So content review, okay to do by subject when you're actually preparing for your exam. So those two, four, six weeks before when you're just really focused on doing questions, do them on random order. It's very useful when you're actually preparing for the multiple choice exam that you do them on random order because in reality, your exam is going to be completely random. You're going to have to go from epidemiology to uh, gynecology to surgery to medicine to some crazy basic science question. So it's really useful to just train your brain and get used to being adaptable and having to jump between different kinds of subjects. And there's a lot of value in that. And then you always, 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 always want to do questions timed. Whether you're doing content review, whether you're preparing for your actual test, always do them timed. It's really invaluable to do these timed because the actual exam has a has pretty strict time constraint. Ryan had mentioned you're averaging 90 seconds a question. That's not a lot of time. And so if you really train yourself and you get in the habit of 
spending five minutes on a question or longer because you're doing it on like tutor mode or whatever, you're, it's going to be really hard to go from five minutes of question down to 90 seconds. And a lot of students struggle with timing. So train yourself early and always do your questions timed. Even if you're doing them by subject, do them timed. Okay. And you really want to develop a system as well of, of approaching the question. So the highlight tool, the when you're crossing answer choices out, and when you're flagging. And you want to do the same thing for every single question, for every single block you do, so that when you get to the actual exam day, you have a system. You're going through, you're reading the question, you're highlighting, and you're going to the answer choices, you're crossing things off. Maybe you're flagging questions that you're not sure about and you want to review later. Develop a system that's right for you and just keep that system. Don't change it. Do it over and over and over again. And that's really going to allow you to be successful when you're practicing these questions. Some people talk about simulating the exam day, and I think that there's some value in this. I don't think it's necessary, but if you're particularly anxious about, you know, sitting down and doing a seven or eight hour test, which is totally reasonable, then what you can do is you can, you know, simulate your test day. And the way you can do this is you just can do seven or eight blocks of UWorld or seven to eight blocks of AMBOSS in one day. Or you could do an MVME in the morning, which is, you know, four blocks and then three blocks of AMBOSS or UWorld in the afternoon. And, and you can use the same timing as you would for the exam to give, you the same, give yourself the same amount of break time um, and then get on the same pace as the exam day. I think this is mostly useful, useful for curbing anxiety. I don't think that there's not necessarily a lot of technical use to this, but if you're anxious and you're kind of um, you're not sure what it's going to feel like to take a seven-hour exam, or you're not sure how you could take your breaks or your snacks or whatever, I think it's fine to simulate the test day, and this will kind of give you a sense of what it'll feel like, and you know that six or seventh hour, how you how you're going to feel with that six or seventh hour, so that you can, can you can set your expectations correctly and kind of prepare yourself for that day. So reviewing question banks. So we talked about when and how you should use your question banks. Now let's talk a little bit about how you should review them. And there is a right and a wrong way to do this. And it's really important that you do this the right way because there's only so many question banks and there's only so many questions. And if you use them all and you didn't maximize their utility, then you're really selling yourself short here. So there are a few things that you should get out of your questions. The first thing is, I always suggest that students review their questions the next day. So if you do questions one day, think about reviewing them the next day, or at least give it a try. And the reason I think that this is really useful is because it'll, a lot, you still remember the question, but you're able to approach it a bit more um, from, a bit, bit, uh, from a bit more of a thoughtful perspective. I oftentimes find that when students review questions immediately after they do them, they'll buzz the question and be like, oh yeah, I remember that question. Um, I knew I got that right, or I knew I got that wrong, and then they skip on to the next question. And when they're doing that, they're really shorting themselves on what they can get out of the question. And the, um, the, the habit to do that right after you did them is, is just it's really tempting, because you're like, oh, I remember I was struggling on a question. Let me just go see if I got it right or wrong really quickly. And then when you do that, you're really, um, you're really not re-reviewing the entire question, which I think was where you get a lot of the value. You should be spending anywhere from two to three hours reviewing a one block of 40 questions. If you're doing it in one hour, you're going way too fast. If you're doing it four or five hours, you're going to have to do it quicker in order to be more efficient with your time. And then um, when you're reviewing the question, this is an opportunity to both practice and learn. So you're going to be learning, you're going to be getting some content out of it, you're going to be understanding a bit more, and you're also going to be focused on practicing. So how can you um, fine-tune your question your, your question and your test-taking strategies, and that's really what you want to get out of this. And then I, another question I get often is, should I redo all of my incorrects? And I, I think this is the answer is variable per person. Most of the time I suggest not doing that unless you have a ton of free time. But instead of re-reviewing all of your incorrects on UWorld, I think you'd get a lot more value in doing another question bank like Amboss. Or, so instead of re spending all this time re-reviewing re -reviewing your incorrects, I would try a new question bank. So when we're reviewing questions, I really review the question breakdown. Um, three different things that you really want to get out of that question when you're reviewing it. The first is the question stem. The second is the answer choices. And the third is the explanation and notes. So let's dive in a little deeper about those and kind of what we can get out of them. So first of all, the question stem. 
it's very important that you reread the entire question stem. And this is another reason why I think reviewing the next day is a useful kind of um, habit to have because if you just read the question and you're reviewing it, you're just so much likely to buzz through the question stem because like, yeah, I remember this. But I think what you want to do is you want to take a fresh perspective question stem, reread the entire thing and pick it apart. So when you're rereading the question, I want you to be actively thinking, okay, what is going on here? Um, where is this question stem taking me? Where is the, the question writer taking me? And then I want you to figure out either where you went down the right path, if you got the question right, or where were you misled if you got the question wrong. And you really want to look for buzzwords and buzz phrases. So pick the question stem apart. Are they young? Are they old? Do they have a fever? Do they not have a fever? What part of the question stem, what buzzwords and what buzz phrases are sending you down a certain pathway? And uh, again, if, if you got the question wrong, then you really want to identify where in this path did I take a wrong turn? Because that, that is really going to be um, what allows you, when you see the question again, and there are similar questions in the future, it's going to allow you to go down the right path. The second is the answer choices. So uh, it's kind of interesting that Ryan had mentioned earlier when the questions are written, the goal is that the question should be answered um, without you even seeing the answer choices. And I actually recommend to students that when they're reviewing their questions, they cover up the answer choices, something with like a sheet of paper um, or like um, a book or something, just cover up those answer choices and just reread the stem. And then at the end of the stem, I want you to think about what the answer is without even looking at the question choices or the answer choices. Think about, you know, do I know what's going on here? Ideally, if you went through the question stem and you went down the right path, you should be able to figure out the answer without even looking at the answer choices. And I think that that's a really useful learning strategy. So cover up those answer choices, put your nickel down and just say, I think it's this, and then remove the remove your kind of covering and look at the answer choices. And sometimes you'll be surprised. It's gonna, the, what you thought was there is gonna be there. Sometimes you're completely lost and you're not really sure. But I think it's a very useful uh, exercise. And then we'll ask just, I think the most obvious, I think what most people do is review the note sets, review the images and review the explanations. And I, I think you're, you really want to use this like a textbook. I mean, the high quality uh, question banks like Amboss or UWorld, the explanations are extremely high yield. And Amboss has a really long and large library of, of notes and images and you really want to take advantage of that. So think of the explanations as uh, another textbook. Look through all the pictures, look through all the pathology slides, and look through all the notes. And then um, do this for all the answer choices, even the wrong ones, because I think you'll get something out of it. Um, and then you can correlate the notes within uh, the, answer, the answer explanation with other things and other resources like YouTube or Google or even other textbooks. And I think linking them together, I think, is, is a really useful cognitive strategy for you to remember things. And then the last part that you want to get out of your question are the answer choices. Um, we had mentioned earlier covering the answer choices. I think that that's really useful to do. Um, you want to review all of your answers, even the ones that are right and even the ones that were wrong. Look at them all. And I think it's also interesting what Ryan mentioned is that all these answer choices, they're on a spectrum. So some are really right and some might be kind of right and some are wrong. It's very rare that you have an answer choice that's just like completely out of this world. They're all meant to be similar and they're all meant to be to confuse you or to require you to understand a certain part of the question stem to get the exact right answer. And so I think it's a useful exercise when you're going through the answer choices, be like, okay, this, this answer was wrong, but why was it wrong? And if something was changed or something was different in the question stem, could this be a right answer? So, you know, if the answer choice is a certain um, antimicrobial, be like, this is a wrong answer, but if it was this kind of bacteria, then maybe this would be the right answer. I think that's also a really useful strategy because then you're learning a lot more. Not only are you learning about the right choice and the right diagnosis, you're also learning more about the wrong ones and how you can change them to identify them better next time. And the most important thing is um, always be honest with yourself. I, I oftentimes find that students will go through all their questions and be like, yeah, I was so close to getting that one. I was like between, it was like 50, 50. And I just, I just guessed wrong. Um, and, and then they'll kind of skip over the question. And I think it's really useful 
to, to recognize that there was a reason why you got this question wrong and the goal is to get it right the next time. So really be honest with yourself. If you got a question wrong, there is a good reason why and, and you really want to review the questions in, in kind of like the systematic way so you can figure out what went wrong so you can get it right next time. Explanation of notes are, are we had already reviewed. Um, you really want to take advantage of those explanations. A few questions that I commonly get is, um, should I take notes? You know, should I be writing everything down? And I think the answer is really variable. It depends on who you are. It uh, depends on how you learn. For me, I found that writing notes was able to keep me engaged and allowed me to synthesize material. I never reviewed those notes, but the actual process of writing the notes was valuable. And so you really want to reflect upon your experience in medical school and think about how do I learn? Is writing notes going to be a useful strategy for me or is it just going to be a waste of time? And the same is true for Anki cards. You know, if you're using Anki and you're a flashcard person, it might be a good tool. If you're not a flashcard person or you've never used Anki, it's probably not a good time to start. Great, so we had a chance to talk about how questions are written. We've talked about how to review your questions. And now Ryan and I are going to work through some questions with you. All right. Thank you, Joel. That was extremely helpful. I think uh, everyone uh, who was, uh, who's listening to us, all of our viewers, found that extremely useful. I, I know I did, even though I don't have to write the steps anymore. Um, all right. I'm going to share my screen now. And what we'll try and do is maybe we just go through a few questions to kind of put all of those important points that Joel mentioned into practice and see how they look when you are actually sitting in front of a question bank. So we are looking right now at a few questions from the Amboss question bank. And what we will also do uh, through the whole time is try and understand the thought process that, uh, that Joel and I kind of recommend that you guys uh, adopt when you uh, go through this. All right, Joel, so here's a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Typical USMLE style question that uh, is in the Amboss question bank. So when you see this question, uh, what would be the first thing that goes into your uh, in your mind, or how would you can you would you like to walk us through your thought process? Yeah, so I think you know uh, the first thing I would do is just kind of while I read the the, the question stem, I'm really going down a, a pathway. I'm looking for buzzwords and buzz phrases like you had mentioned. So. Um, you, you can just start from this top and just say 68 year old man hey so it's a an older gentleman which is kind of narrowing what you're thinking about and they go to the next cough dyspnea fever so cough dyspnea fever immediately is pointing me towards some sort of infection of fever and then particularly a lung infection so uh, already coming up in my head it's some sort of lung infection is this some sort of pneumonia um, the cough is productive of small amounts of green phlegm so that pretty much is telling me that this is um, a pneumonia and it's a bacterial pneumonia because the the green phlegm is um, like break down neutrophils and bacteria. So I'm pretty sure it's already a bacterial pneumonia. You know, right then and there, I could skip to the end and just look at what the question is answering. Um, but in this case, I'll, you know, as, assuming that we're reviewing it after we've done the question, I'll kind of just go through the rest of it and see if I can keep down that path. Um, the next thing they say, he's got metastatic colon cancer, has re received some chemo. I'm not really sure what to make of that. I think that either might be a, dis a distractor or they might be getting at that the patient might be immunocompromised or might be susceptible to certain kinds of bugs. Um, he has COPD, so he already has previous lung disease, which makes me think maybe this is like a COPD exacerbation versus a true pneumonia. Uh, he's previously been treated with antibiotics and steroids for acute exacerbation, exacerbation. so maybe I'm thinking maybe it's more likely to be a COPD ex uh, exacerbation. He takes inhalers at home, nothing really is telling or surprising about that. He's a smoker for 48 years. Again, that's not really too surprising because he has COPD, but he definitely has a true fever, 103 Fahrenheit. He's tachycardic, he's tachypnic, he's slightly hypotensive, and he's uh, fairly hypoxic. So I'm, I'm really thinking that this guy has a raging lung infection or an, um, likely a pneumonia. And then, the, the, sure enough, the lung exam got diffuse crackles. And then the chest x-ray really kind of drives it home with a left upper lobe infiltrate. So I, this question stem was fairly straightforward. It's saying this person for sure has a, a pneumonia. Um, blood cultures are obtained. They don't give you the results. And the tracheal aspirate uh, shows GNR. So really telling you that this is a pneumonia. So the challenge of this question is not so much the presentation, but um, here they are asking about antibiotic choice. So 
Uh, all those things kind of point you to the direction of a pneumonia, and then you just kind of have to use that data to choose antibiotics. Lovely. Yeah. One thing that struck with me was uh, how you said that if I was going to, uh, if I was doing this in a way where I was trying to get to the answer quickly, or when you, so basically when, if you were trying to do it in a random right. time tuned, uh, timed mode, or if you're uh, facing this situation, the exam, uh, you, you mentioned that you're going to immediately start kind of narrowing things down as you read through it. And uh, that's, th that's actually extremely important also. So in the review, to kind of break it down in your mind, I find I find that really, really useful. It is something that I don't think I l learned to do initially, but uh, it was beaten into me in the, by, by how I was preparing. I realized that this is something that I should be doing. And I think that is super useful. I hope that the viewers take that and in, uh, internalize that. If I was doing this in a timed way, under time pressure, I think one of the things that I like to do is uh, I see immediately I look at it and I'm like, okay, this is a long question. It's got more than five sentences. Right. It's going to take me some time to read. I want to get right to the answer. Though. So the first thing I kind of do is look at the last bit of the question to get an orientation as to what they're asking. And I see, okay, they're asking for pharmacotherapy. Right. And I look... And then all the, all the answer choices are antibiotics. Exactly. Too, so so I, you know that you're going to answer something about antibiotics exactly so it's like at, right at that point i'm like okay this is infective then i see the first few lines and i'm like okay this is respiratory so it's a respiratory infection and then all i'm doing is i'm looking for the etiology because it's an antibiotic it, my choice of antibiotics is always going to be based on the etiology so i'm just looking for hints for it uh, for the etiology and the diagnosis like in the sense that okay what is the infective diagnosis on this patient so in that way, if I come to it, this, I mean, it does look a little bit like a community acquired pneumonia. So I'm going to click for what I know works for CAP and it happens to be correct. Now, the next question is, all right, so there is an information, uh, there is an explanation why this is correct. Uh, for those who have not seen AMBOS, there will always be like these helpful images, flow charts, which will kind of explain to you more. And in case I wanted to review it a little bit further, I could also, so this happened to me a lot. I used to annotate my first aid because yes, I mean, I would use so much material and I needed one centralized place for a review. So what we tried to build into, build into Amboss is that you have this one centralized place where you can review. So if I had red pneumonia and I wanted to just understand it, uh, what I could do or what, if I wanted to know a little bit more, it would I could click right there and it would open the whole chapter next to it. Not just that, it would even highlight the parts of the uh, chapter which I require to review this information. So that was all well and good to kind of know why a correct answer is Correct. But if you were reviewing, uh, do you think you would also uh, review the wrong answers at this point, Joel? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things we, we had mentioned earlier is when you're reviewing, like you can actually get a lot of um, learning out of the answer choices, even the wrong ones. And so it's really important to go through each one of them and say, why is this wrong? You know, what situation would this be right? So for example, you know, just looking at vancomycin, you know, vancomycin here is wrong because the, the patient's growing gram-negative rods, and we know that vancomycin mostly covers gram-positive cocci. So, and then your head think about, okay, that's wrong in this situation, but in what situation could that be right? And that could be right in like, um, if someone, it's a hospital-acquired pneumonia and um, the endotracheal aspirate is gram-positive cocci, and that would be a situation with vancomycin is right. So you do that for each of the answer choices, yeah. and you're actually going to kind of maximize your learning because you could think you're you're making sure that you really understand like the right and the wrong answers, yeah. which is really key. And um, some people just kind of gloss over that, but you really, if you do that, you're really missing out on um, a really key uh, opportunity for learning. Exactly. I so one thing that struck with me when you were presenting is you use this phase what you can get out of your question bank. And mm -hmm. that's the point. I mean, we have to, as students, as uh, USMLE aspirants, 
have to also think of the choice we make in a question bank or any resource as your investment in it and you're looking to get your return on investment right and that's why right. you should probably be squeezing everything that you can get out of it that's going to help right. you and, the, and there's a finite number of questions and question banks and there's a finite number of high quality questions and question banks and yeah you know if you're buzzing through things really quickly um you're really selling yourself short absolutely um all right so if if i was to review everything that would kind of in a way mean that for one question i'm picking up one and two five so about five connected concepts i'm kind of mind mapping right. comparing and contrasting because the next time right. i get a question which looks somewhat similar i'm going to look for okay if it is gram positive is there anything which kind of indicates it's an mrsa okay that's why it's vancomycin so these are things that i didn't set out to learn but kind of just absorbed in the process right uh right. all right then there are these kind of questions the kind the kinds where the stem is extremely small there is a, a a table right there quite prominently and you pretty much expect uh findings to be kind of important the findings that are given out to you um mm -hmm. for this is there anything specific you would do uh joel or would you uh, do you want to talk about a certain aspect no, of is, reviewing it yes yeah, so i guess hold on so um when you're just approaching the question this one's so short you could you could just read it really you're not going to save too much time by jumping to the end or anything so you see a 54 year old lady so middle-aged lady sharp chest pain shortness of breath you're immediately thinking, am I PE yeah. somewhere in your brain? Yeah. Coughing intermittently. Okay, maybe this is like a muscle strain or maybe it's like weird pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, but she said it worsens the pain. So that's really telling us it's pleuritic chest pain, which makes me think even more that it's a PE. Yeah. She has osteoporosis, takes raloxifene. Raloxifene is associated with increased risk of PE. Yeah. They give you an ABG. And then they're asked about physical exam findings. So we look at the ABG, you just in interpret this using your, you know, you know that's why you're using the knowledge that you've already attained. So you yeah. can tell this person is alkalemic. Yeah. They've got low CO2 and high and low oxygen, uh, which mean, which suggests to me the person's hypoxemic. So I, I would imagine this person's tachypnic. Yeah. So just with that presentation, you know, if we're reviewing this question, like we've already taken the question, I would have had covered the answer choices. And just yeah. with that presentation, you should be able to come to a conclusion that this is probably likely to be um, a PE. Yeah. And then if you're kind of following our strategy for reviewing the question, so say you've already answered it and now you're reviewing it. Yeah. What physical exam is most likely to show which of the following? So if you're saying if this is PE, what are some physical exam findings of PE? Well, tachycardia, tachypnea, um, yeah. leg pain or leg swelling are, are, are some uh, physical exam findings. And sure enough, if you were to remove the answer choices, and that, you'll see that unilateral swelling of the leg is there, which yeah. is probably the, the most likely answer. Absolutely. And that, that could be also a great confidence boost because at the end of the day, that's what the NBME is trying to test, whether you can answer a question right. without looking at the options, right? And if you get to it, if you find it right there, you are then not second guessing yourself because you know that all of the information that you've utilized right. to solve the answer is has come from you reading the question. And it's not. Yeah, I think, you know, when you're actually taking the exam, you know, you're probably never gonna you're probably not gonna feel that way often. But I think when you're learning and when you're reviewing questions, it's really useful to to challenge yourself like that. Yeah. Yeah. A absolutely. Um a, a few things that I wanted to kind of show people, and I think that would make sense in maybe uh, another smaller question, just to kind of review. So I know that there is always a lot of information. Sometimes there is a lot more than the others, depending. Step one usually has shorter questions. The The thing that happens, and I'm sure this happened to you as well, Joel, is like the key pieces of information in questions, your eyes just start getting trained the more and more questions you do for these things to right. pop, right? And mm -hmm. So what we tried to do with AMBOSS, and uh, I'm sure you've kind of noticed this, is that we've tried to have these little key info things. Um, nice. This tool, basically what it tries to do is it, if a student does not know the answer or can't get to the answer, what we are trying to do is replicate the experience of being taught 
so the tool tells you, okay, there is a lot of information. Just just focus on this bit of the information, kind of, right? And then if you just focus on this, and then you keep on doing more and more questions. After a while, you don't require the key info because you're trained, and these things kind of pop to you. It's the same thing with right. uh, we give a little hint. We try and basically get the students to come up with the answer themselves, then rather than just. I don't know, like just looking at the answer immediately. And I'm sure right. that's kind of something that you have uh, feel as well, where the student needs to kind of test themselves or push themselves to, to apply what they've learned. Right? Right. Absolutely. All right. Then there's the last bit. Okay. Uh, there are these questions. So now, again, as we said, there will be image questions. Is this something? Or rather, okay, uh, let, let's go through this question quickly and then we can go to the image. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're just going through this question really quick, we see a 47-year-old woman, so a middle-aged woman, one-week history, productive cough and fatigue. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of nonspecific. I'm not thinking, it's not really telling me too much yet. Yeah. Two weeks ago, she had fever, nasal congestion, myalgia, um, resolved with supportive care, uh, it's still not telling me too much. I mean, yeah. maybe she's got some sort of lung respiratory, you know, upper airway infection, maybe, but nothing, no grand slam yet. Yeah. Pulmonary exam shows dullness to percussion increased firmness at the right lower lobe. So that's telling me that there is some sort of consolidation. So yeah. I think her physical exam presenting symptoms are not that cons that that um, much of a grand slam, but I would say that the, the actual lung exam probably tells you it's an pneumonia. Yeah. And then they're asking about a sputum sample, so it's probably a pneumonia. Yeah. And then they give you an image. Yeah, exactly. And at the image, it's maybe something I would like to highlight about the AMBOSS question bank. Um, radiology has always been a bit of a challenge for radiology, ECGs, histopath. It's always a bit of a challenge because there's your lecturer in the class saying that, okay, look over there. And that's where you're seeing a consolidation. Yeah. That's where you're seeing a, an air fluid level. But to the untrained eye, it just looks like white, black, and gray. <laughs> and uh, so for me, it w really started making sense during emergency medicine when uh, when the ch chief or a senior would tell, tell you literally, uh, would point out on the film and tell you, look here. So that's what we kind of tried to do with uh, AMBOSS images, uh, be it radiology, be it ECGs. There, there is a there are overlays on there which kind of draw your eye towards the pathology. And then with this one, it kind of shows that, okay, there is uh, an air fluid level. There is a fairly well circ circumscribed lesion. So it, it, you're, you're thinking of a pulmonary abscess. Again, going in the same thought process of developing pattern recognition, which is how we are all going to get better at solving questions, at reading x-rays, reading ECGs. So, Yeah. And then because it's a lung abscess, I'm guessing Joel, you and I are on the same page, it looks more like a, a lung abscess is more likely to be a gram GPC, a gram positive cocci. So, right. A stuff. Yeah. So there we go. So again, it, if we, if we go back to all of the, all of the important points that you said, it covers it in that way where it says, all right, we are looking for, uh, we are looking at information, we are looking at the wrong answers to really get the logic behind it. No, not just the what and the how, but the whys of things. And I guess that's right. the only true way to kind of get through any NBME exam is like depth of knowledge and application of it. Right. And I think, you know, that last question was a great example. I know when we talked earlier, it's a great example when you want to use Google. So the power of Google. Yes. So look at that, you know, you read that chest x-ray and it says, you know, a lung abscess. You're like, I don't see it. Or you're like, I totally see it. Google chest x-ray lung abscess and look at 10 different chest x-rays showing yeah. the same thing. Yeah. You'll notice they're a little different because the, the, the and then the picture you get on the exam is not going to be that picture. And sometimes they're you see, they just have a bit, each are a little different. They don't all look the same. And so that's a really great opportunity for you to look at multiple chest x-rays using, again, it's such a simple tool as Google. And then really seeing it in each of these x-rays, you can still 
repeat what you're seeing. So yeah. it's nice to have it highlighted, but when it's when you take the highlight away and when you look at different imaging, yeah. can you still um, identify that lung abscess? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, that was pretty much it from our end, I, I would imagine. Um, and yeah, uh, I hope this was helpful to all of you, Joel. Uh, any closing words from your end? Yeah, no, just apps. Thanks for having us. I hope it was useful. It was really, really great to, to collaborate with Amboss and really work with Ryan and see, you know, to think about how Amboss questions are created, how the review system is really uh, optimized and maximized to to allow you to review. It's been a, re a really great opportunity. I hope you guys really enjoyed it and, and got something useful out of it. Yeah. So all the best to all of you. And uh, we'll just leave you with one little uh, thing that Joel and I were talking while we were presenting this and coming up with uh, this. And an interesting thing that came up that Joel and I were uh, laughing about was how how anyone who has who knows these exams well or who's done well at these exams, although we keep telling people there's not any one way to go about it, it seems to be that all of us kind of match in terms of what is the right way to go about a question bank uh, to an extent of 80 to 90 percent of what we are saying and we hope that today we've been able to kind of consolidate in your thinking uh, a mind map a, a playbook as to how you want to go about utilizing your question bank and yes and all the best we hope that uh, this has been helpful this is Ryan from the Amboss team and Joel saying bye. Thank you so much. Take care, guys.